With climate change, previously unlikely natural disasters are becoming more and more common. So the series is me trying to figure out how we can create truly resilient cities, and here's the first question I have. How do we design for earthquakes? And then diving into that, why do some buildings collapse and not others? Are tall buildings more dangerous in an earthquake? Are wooden buildings better than concrete? And which countries have the best earthquake-proof buildings? Places that are most susceptible to earthquakes are those located along plate boundaries. The Pacific Plate meets other tectonic plates in this horseshoe called the Ring of Fire, where roughly 90% of all earthquakes occur. These places like Japan, New Zealand, and California generally prepare for earthquakes because they occur so often. These are the earthquakes with a magnitude of 6 or higher in the past 50 years. But there are other plates and fault lines besides the Ring of Fire, and though earthquakes are not as common, they can often be more deadly because they're not expected. Very rarely is the ground splitting the cause of destruction in an earthquake. Rather, it's the aftershocks that send waves through the earth and shake up buildings and infrastructure. Think back to your high school physics class. Just as an opera singer can make a glass break or a bridge can oscillate too much under certain conditions, every building has a natural frequency, a sort of internal rhythm at which it naturally vibrates. This is known as the resonance frequency where the building experiences oscillations at maximum amplitude. The building's resonance frequency is influenced by factors like its mass, height, and the materials used. In general, shorter buildings are more susceptible to short period low amplitude waves, while taller structures are affected by longer waves. If the ground's resonance frequency matches the buildings, then you have the perfect recipe for disaster. The countries that have the strictest earthquake regulations have them because they've experienced the immense damage that earthquakes can have, but other countries shouldn't wait for the next disaster to strike to start improving. So how do you know if you're in an earthquake safe building? You might think that a certain building material is key to earthquake proofing a building. Should you build with concrete or bricks which are stronger, or should you build with wood which is flexible? Bricks and stones might seem like the first choice because they're what we consider to be strong, quality materials. They are heavy and stiff, and under no external forces, stiffness is good. European buildings are typically made of brick and have been standing for centuries. However, once the force threshold is met, stiff materials can fail suddenly. This is called brittleness, and bricks and masonry buildings, especially those held together with mortar, are particularly brittle. They tend to crack, crumble, or buckle under movement. European buildings can be made of brick and mortar because Europe typically doesn't experience many earthquakes. But those parts that have seen quakes in recent years have definitely seen the damage they can do on brick and stone buildings. That being said, stone doesn't have to be ruled out completely if used properly. Dry stone techniques exemplified by the Japanese, Inca, and Mycenaeans offer remarkable earthquake resistance despite using brittle materials. These methods involve meticulously carving stones to interlock, preventing excessive movement during seismic activity while allowing just enough leeway for the stones to settle back into place. This approach, known as cyclopean construction, is a passive structural control technique that combines energy dissipation and resonant suppression principles. Stone castles like those seen in Osaka and Nagoya have even demonstrated better earthquake endurance than some wooden temples and shrines. Is it a coincidence that all these places are in earthquake hotspots? I don't think so, but of course, craftsmanship like this is hard to find these days and it's not practical for taller buildings. In general, when it comes to earthquake resilience, buildings are better off with more ductile materials that will bend before they break, enabling swaying in various directions without fracturing. Though the structure may deform, it won't collapse. Ductile materials include steel, which is able to undergo large deformations before failure, as well as wood and bamboo, which permit flexing and can revert to their original shape. Wood is lighter in comparison to concrete and places less stress on underlying walls, reducing the risk of collapse. This pagoda in Japan is a famous example of a wooden structure that has withstood many earthquakes over time.
you can get even better earthquake performance with a combination of these materials. For example, reinforced concrete turns brittle concrete into a higher ductile material. It's common now, but it didn't always used to be. Without steel reinforcement, concrete is prone to cracking and structural failure in buildings that are put under stress from high winds or ground vibrations. But just because a building is constructed with ductile materials doesn't make it appropriate for earthquake safety, because the shape and structure of the building is just as important if not more. Mainly, we want to avoid structural irregularities, and that's really an engineer's way of saying avoiding asymmetry. We can have symmetry along the x-axis, the y-axis, and rotational symmetry, and these types of buildings are the most regular, and have historically fared the best in earthquakes. Mass irregularities and capacity irregularities are also non-trivial for earthquake safety. For example, though mixed-use buildings are great from an urban planning perspective, we need to be careful of those buildings with irregularities in capacity. If they look like this, they are soft-story structures where the bottom floor offers less support than the floors above and can't support the weight of the upper floors during a quake. It's buildings like these that are unfortunately disastrous during earthquakes, and it includes residential buildings too. In San Francisco alone, more than 400 soft-story structures, multi-million dollar soft-story structures, have not been retrofitted. And I've seen buildings like this all over Los Angeles. It's pretty safe to say that most all buildings are built to withstand a reasonable gravity load. But how do we build to withstand lateral loads? Really, in earthquake-prone areas, buildings should have braced frames, moment frames, and shear walls. Taller buildings may consider seismic joints to reduce the impact of collisions with neighboring buildings and enhance lateral stability. As some of these buildings are already existing, there's not much to do but retrofit your building to be stronger. But now it's pretty easy to visually identify buildings that should be earthquake resistant from those that are clearly not. Unlike single-family homes or mid-rise buildings, skyscrapers have most likely undergone significant modeling and testing, and since most use steel, tall buildings tend to be quite flexible. But common vulnerabilities still include resonance, interaction with neighboring structures, and the potential for column shear failure. In places like Japan and Taiwan, high-rise buildings incorporate cutting-edge seismic engineering solutions. Damping systems such as tuned mass dampers or viscous dampers are employed to mitigate resonance and sway. Tuned mass dampers involve suspending a high mass ball from a fixed structure on top of a building. When the building oscillates during an earthquake, the pendulum swings in the opposite direction, helping to stabilize the structure. These advanced strategies significantly contribute to the earthquake resilience of high-rise buildings so that we can still have buildings like the Tokyo Skytree in one of the most earthquake-prone regions in the world. Completed in 2012, the Tokyo Skytree is 634 meters and incorporates a central column system that reduces seismic vibration, two mass damper systems installed at the top, and seismic dampers at the base. In addition to strengthening your building with these methods, you can also shield a building from the force of an earthquake. This is done by isolating the base of the building from the Earth's movements. Isolators absorb and dissipate the seismic energy, significantly reducing stress and potential damage to the structure. So, if you can manage to isolate your structure, you can be a bit more flexible in your building design. In Japan, base isolation technology is the preferred choice for skyscrapers and other tall structures despite the substantial financial investment it requires. It's widely recognized as the most secure and effective approach to earthquake resilience. In earthquake-prone regions, the challenge isn't so much getting buildings to stand as it is ensuring they remain standing when subjected to external forces. We have the know-how to create robust buildings, but many places still have earthquake standards that aim to minimize loss of life rather than minimize damage. Even if the standards were raised, as they have been in many countries, having standards is one thing and implementing them is an entirely different challenge. Due to economics, often standards aren't kept or enforced. 
Yes, picking high-quality soil, having a sound architectural design, a robust foundation, and earthquake mitigation technologies entail additional costs. But the estimated additional expense for earthquake preparedness in a 7-story building is only around 13-15%. to 15% 15 may seem too much for those that prioritize short-term gains and quick fixes, but it holds the potential for a substantial long-term savings and safety. For high-rise buildings, so much thought and calculation has to go into the design and construction, which makes things like this very worrisome because the quality of construction isn't just an economic issue, we're talking about the safety of many lives. But I digress because earthquakes are just one weapon in Mother Nature's arsenal, and we still have to tackle water, fire, and wind, which can be just as destructive if not more destructive. So stay tuned for the next videos and let me know your thoughts. If you want to get more technical about earthquake engineering, I've left some really interesting links in the description.